everybody, I'm Scotty J. You are watching Rock Titan Music Television. I have got a extremely special guest with us today. And I'll tell you what, I'm actually going to make one of my New Year's resolutions early, okay? Because we get to talk with a lot of rock stars and celebrities these days, but you know what? I think one thing is missed. The one thing that I have been neglectful of, and shame on me, is not focusing on the icons, the legends of rock and roll, music at large, that inspired all of the talent that we're seeing out there in mainstream music world today, all right? And the guest that I'm talking with right now is none other than Corky Lang, legendary drummer for the band Mountain. I am humbled, Scott. I'm humbled because I know you've talked to a great deal of brilliant musicians. As it turns out, yeah, they were celebrities. But I feel very humbled. I am a rock drummer, and I've managed to be very, I'm a very lucky guy. I say live by the four-letter word. It's called luck, okay? And uh, that's what I've been blessed with. So, um, again, you're very, you're very kind, and, and I'll accept that with all kind of the humbleness that I can. Well, I'll How's tell, that? I, well, and it's great, it's great to be yes. on rock. On, on Rock Titan TV. I love it. I just love the name. I mean, you're calling for it. How can you not do Rock Titan? Right. I haven't heard that description, I don't know, since, uh, I don't know, Douglas and, and Spartacus. I don't know. You know, Titan. I love it. Go ahead. Quirky, I, thank I, you. I, and, and, and I'm not blowing smoke here. You are a Rock Titan. So it is my true honor and privilege to be hosting you on our show today you know it's just after christmas right we've got new year's ahead of us and as i just told all of our fans out there you truly are an icon i know that you don't necessarily see yourself that way but i know that there's a lot of drummers out there and a lot of the biggest bands you know that are you know being talked about in all the magazines and on the radio and stuff like that today that i know if they had the opportunity to be in my shoes or my slippers right now and be and be talking to Corky Lang, they'd much rather be doing that, you know, than doing whatever it is that they're doing. But, uh, you know, so this... I w I'd like you to put on your shoes. <laughs> the slippers, that I'm, metaphor is great. I'm, I'm oh, wearing my, great. My, my comfy, I'm, I'm wearing my, my thinking shoes, all right? Just my thinking, thinking, hat, my thinking Think shoes. Think on. Yes, yeah. yes. But what an exciting day, you know? I, I had a chance to speak with your beautiful bride for a nice while before we had a chance to catch up. And uh, today, you, you got a brand new drum kit, yeah? I have just received, uh, I, that's why I'm a little delayed right now, uh, from Tampa, Florida, a D drum set. And I've had, I've had, I've been very fortunate to have played many different uh, drum sets, Slingerland, Ludwig, Pearl. Again, I, I just I just love drums. You know, Scott, there's no I don't think when you look around in the music stores, there's one instrument that comes comes shooting out and that's the drums. You'll never ever see a bad looking set of drums. They're all more beautiful than the other. But I have just received a red sparkle set of drums. Mm -hmm. And you know, it's like when you're a kid and you're walking down the street and you see the music store window mm -hmm. and you see this beautiful drum kit when you're hey, 15 years old and you're going, wow, that's where I want to be. <laughs> I want to be sitting on the throne on that drum. I, I, gotta, I can't talk enough about it. Look at you. You're kidding. You're, you're kidding. I love it. <laughs> it, gets, it gets into you. And, you know, over the years, um, it really, it, it makes no different. I shouldn't say, I gotta be careful here, but I played so many kits and there were years when we didn't even have to bring our own equipment that the venue would supply the back line. Wow. Sometimes it would be the opening shows, the special guests. And I got a chance to play on, all I would bring is my cowbell, and my sticks, and I would play. And I'm sorry to say that I, at the time, I didn't schlep, as they say in French, I didn't schlep my kit around the country. I would use what kits were available. As you play like that, if you get a kit that's tom-tom heavy, 
you play Tom Toms. Yeah. If you get a kit that doesn't have good symbols, you stay away from the symbols. But basically, there's a barrel and there's a skin, and you play the skin and the barrel, and hopefully it makes sense and it communicates in whatever vast areas of archival drums you can play. It's it's wonderful. Anyways, I've got my own silver sparkle kit again. That's what I'm saying. And I'll take pictures and I'll send it to you. And uh, yeah, it's really wonderful. Considering like here I am like 71 years old and I feel like I'm 18 years old. I got a new kit. Now I got to learn to play drums. That's the only hope, <laughs> you know. I'm 71 years young. What are you talking about, Corky? Well, I don't 70. I, I don't tell you. I just, hey, I got the pulse in here. I'm happy with it. And thank God a lot of our cohorts and our brothers and music, brothers and sisters in music are still there loving it, you know. And uh, I think there's more music being played every which way but loose than ever, you right. know. So you, there's nobody can complain about, like, I don't know what I like. It's out there, and I know that I love drums. So I can sit here and become a promo slut and start, you know, hyping all the stuff that I'm doing. But I think I will. As a matter of fact, <laughs> <laughs> let me rewind on that one. Uh, no, just um, this kit is going to, it's going to, I think it will reinvent me again. You nice. know what I mean? You get an issue, all of a sudden. And I unpacked the, and yes, we drum roadies and all. Forget that. This is my kit. And I opened the box and I put, you have to assemble some of the drums. But, oh, it's just wonderful. Spanking new. I feel like I'm playing like a virgin set. Like I'm first on this kit. Nice. So without getting too spiritual, you are hearing me ramble on because I've had 14 coffees this morning. There you go. So you, I may ramble on, but... I can't say enough about drums. That's what I'll tell you. Now, now let me ask you, Corky, with this new drum kit that you got here, you didn't happen to get a cowbell with it, did you? No, they don't give you cowbells. <laughs> don't do that. No, the cowbells <laughs> I can't are help special. myself. I no, can't help myself. You got, you got me on that one. But I have kept the cowbell or the couple of cowbells that I did play on that first session with mountain climbing, you know, we had Mississippi Queen, never in my oh, life. Nice. I used the cowbell a great deal. So I've kept those cowbells, and I paid like $1.79 Canadian in Montreal when I bought my first cowbell. But now, from what I understand, I've been offered on eBay, I've been offered like thousands of dollars oh, for that cowbell. I'm not, I'm not going to go there right now, but what I will say is that running into people like Levon Helm and, and Carmine, who was on your show, yeah. and Barbie, all these drummers, and they're telling me, how did you get the reputation for the heavy metal? Right and I'm going, I have no idea, but it, I'll take it. But the point is, I remember I had timbales. Scott, I had these, I couldn't afford the real drums, so I got these beat up timbales, and then I had the cowbell, which is pretty hard. And in those days, in order to play over and above, you know, the stacks of marshals or strap or whatever amps they were, we're talking about stacks. In order to cut yeah. through on stage, I had to play, I had to hit, the cowbells were like, neutron bombs you know i don't know if in, in those days it was not it was not sophisticated you had a microphone and you beat the shit out of the drums as hard as you could to try to fit in with the bass player and the guitar player anyway so i've got this reputation because i'm playing these metal oriented drums right and as it as it turned out when i started making a few shekels I decided to go out and get myself real tom-toms. Okay. And I did. And people would say, what happened at Timbales? And I went, well, uh, you know, I thought the Timbales were kind of, you know, Woolworths kind of cheap. But they weren't. It was like at that point, I think the only people that were using cowbells were, uh, what's his name? The Bouchard uh, Brothers. Yeah. Albert Bouchard. <laughs> um, point being, um, to, I, I love Latin music, so okay. I used to play, be, be, in my local band, we would play dance music. So the timbales, mm -hmm. they cut, but they were just, you know, you know, 
Anyways, check you so up. I learned. I learned. Well, in those days, you had the you had the inkwell. We're going back now, Scott. You yeah. had the inkwell on your desk, and so I used to use the right, you know, cha cha one two cha 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 one two cha. And I remember I was playing with my pencil, the right hand on the inkwell. And the ink well had a nice sound, ding, 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 right? Yeah. And I remember when the, you know, it was grade four or five, the teacher came over, Mr. Lang, what do you think you're doing? I said, I'm, I'm playing the cha cha. I'm playing the, cha and, and she looked at me, take your cha cha and go down to the principal's office and you tell him <laughs> why you're interrupting my class, Mr. Lang. So I go to the principal's office and he says to me, Mr. Lang, um, why are you here? I said, I don't know. I was just tapping a cha-cha. Beso mi mucho is what I was playing. Beso mi mucho. And he said, he says, well, what's going on? Well, um, I said, well, sir, I want to grow up and I want to be a rock star. And he <laughs> says to me, you got to pick one thing or the other. <laughs> That's what he said. But anyways, kachis, right? But the, what, what point am I trying to make except that what a wonderful life it is yeah. to be here talking about this stuff that we're talking and actually in some ways almost making a living. I say almost. Well, I, I, well, obviously things have changed, you know, since yeah. you started out as a professional musician in the 60s. And, yeah. uh, you know, here we are today. But, you know, again, yeah. I was, uh, you know, speaking with some other folks <laughs> prior to our right. conversation. I mean... Yeah. What a blessing it must feel like, you know, for all these decades later to still be playing, to still be performing and getting paid to do it. I mean, yeah, the key, the key is to get the call that people want you to come to play. Right. Now, Risa, I just returned from the UK and Europe. Uh, we did about a month, six weeks overseas. And yeah, over there. People, I, when they love you, they don't go by your last 45 seconds on a record. You know what I mean? They love you because you play. Right. And, and in other words, yes, they're not fickle in many cases. And I say them. I'm talking about the music lovers right. like yourself. Sure. You know who you love and you know why you love it. And between you and I, it places you at a time in your life. A song will put you at that moment, right? I love soundtracks it. of yes, your life. Absolutely. And I'm, and I'm just saying that it was, it, it was, it's a wonderful thing to get a call like that. Say, by the way, I'd like to come over and play. And this is 50 years later, right? And um, yeah, how much more blessed can you be than that? I happen to just, I happen to love, well, I love music, but I really love drums. It's almost as good as sex. Well, it depends <laughs> on sex, you know. But I share a lot of your, a lot of your interview ease. I feel the same way. It's yeah. not unusual. If we're talking to you about music, it means you love it, we love it, and people will listen and they'll squeeze what they can out of a conversation. But all I can tell you is that when you play drums, when you sit down at a drum set, as long as you've got a pulse, you're a drummer. You know, Some people right are drum owners and other people are drummers, but we're all very lucky to have a pulse. That's that's the segue into like living. Without, have a pulse. without a doubt. And you know, obviously you've had a very successful career and one of your favorite four letter words being luck, you know, right. has played a part in that. But you've also built some amazing relationships over the years. And I have to imagine that networking in the music industry and meeting a lot of the musicians that you've met, that's probably led to a lot of your longevity in the industry. Would that be accurate? That would be very accurate because the people that we get to know going back, if they're still around, they're still around because they got the heartbeat in the right place, you know? And uh -huh. yeah, we've lost a few brothers and sisters over the years, right. but they've only, they've only disappeared, you know, physically. I think the, the musicians I think you're talking about that have moved on are uh, more influential yeah. than ever. Than ever. In other words, you know, Prince, uh, Michael Jackson. I'm talking about more popular ones. Yeah. But you go back, like I mentioned, Lee Von Howe. He's around me as much as he ever was. Wow. I do miss. I do miss his conversation. You know, because right. we would sit 
it so happens I became good friends with him. And I stopped by in Woodstock and we sit around all night and we talk about the, the digital recordings and all the way the music format has changed. And he, it was really great. One night I said, so what do you think about all these programmed drums? And he said, Gorky, he says, music is a very special thing. You can do anything to music. Music don't care. And I was thinking, that's a brilliant statement. Music don't care. It's what you do to it, right? Mm -hmm. Anyway, so if you're lucky enough to get into that musical world, that loop, it's, you don't want to spin out. You want to stay right there. And yes, you're right. You'll cross paths with all different people. In those days, by the way, everybody was touring. And when they were touring, they were hanging out because there was nothing else to do, yeah. you know. And that was probably some of the best times, you know. As it turned out, Mountain recorded everything, every show we played, uh, because Felix Papillardi, the bass player, was a producer. Really? And as it turned out, we were using the Stones recording truck, no you know. And, wow. and, you know, and then all of a sudden you're hanging with, you know, the guys would come in, you know, Mick Jagger would come in, how you doing, how's the truck? Stuff like that. Not that they've made a great interest in it, but we were also managed by the same people in England as The Who. So we became friendly with them. And of course, one of my all-time favorite people in the world is Keith Moon. So during those years, as you move along, the tempo changes, you know, the tempo of life. Every decade or so, you'll feel a whole different tempo going from marching after the war, you know, into the jazz, the celebration. And then you have the Latin thing where, you know, it, every there's always something around the corner. There's always something around the corner. And you jump on board. It's a great ride. It's right a on. great ride. And you do it any way you do it. And you meet people. And I'm not blowing smoke up your bum bum. I'm just saying that it's great to have people who love it the same way. Now, there are listeners, there are players, and there are both. The point is, it is great. I can't say enough about it. I'm starting to sound pretty silly. I no, think no, it's, no. Uh, I, I, think it can, it's so, I think it's so interesting, though, Corky, because, you know, in, in the amount of time that you've been making amazing music, I think it's cool to see how many things, just in the course of my lifetime, Things have kind of come full circle, you know, and we're almost to a point where things are starting to repeat. We're starting to see history repeat itself. We're seeing yes. the popularity of vinyl because of its unique analog sound coming back. We're right. seeing that good old classic rock and roll, you know, come back. We're seeing young musicians now coming out and they're producing music, you know, that is lyrically and, and musically very similar to what you would see, you know, back in the 60s and the 70s. Yeah. Um, and you're seeing this youthful infusion uh, I, I really start to take shape. It's really neat. I was actually uh, telling your wonderful wife earlier, one of the coolest gifts that my daughter, my 16-year-old daughter, got for Christmas was a Beatles hoodie. My daughter's favorite <laughs> band is the Beatles. That's funny. That's great. You know, That but, is great, yes. And you're seeing so much of this. You know, nowadays, and, you know, all this reference to certain bands just because they're so huge now and they're up for four Grammys coming up here. Yeah. Greta Van Fleet. Yeah. You know, I mean, these guys are, you know, 21, 19 years old. All right. Yeah. They're just coming out. And who do they sound like? They, Led Zeppelin. You know, I mean, that's that's the style that they are, you know, really bringing back to life. Do you have any thoughts on that? Like some of the, the bands out there nowadays, some of this youthful infusion coming in, playing the kind of music that you've been making your entire life? Well, uh, I have thoughts. Um, sure, it's all, sure. They're all Positive, very, negative. They're all, yeah, they're all pretty, po coincidentally, a friend of mine who happens to be a drummer in Ted Nugent's band, uh, Jason Hartless Jr., he's out of Detroit. Right. And he, st he started a label with his dad called Rouge Records. Okay. And they're working they're working basically under the same umbrella as Jack White's uh, Third Man Records. Okay. So he's an old fan of mine. Old, he's a young fan. He's right. 20 odd years. And he says, Cork, you know, I've always loved this record, Secret Sessions, that you did with Ian Hunter, Todd Rundgren, and, 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 and Mick Ronson. He says, but it was never on vinyl. Would you give me permission to put out a vinyl? 
And I'm looking at him, I say, are you kidding? That would be great. That's awesome. I mean, you know, talk about full circle. So last January, I get, they pressed, I guess they were going to press three or 400 vinyl. And they said, Court, I said, well, at least save one for me. If, if, you know, I didn't expect it to do much. But anyways, so he said, it happens to be released on Sony. So apparently Jason calls me and he says, by the way, Sony wants to press 1,500 vinyls. Wow. And I went, are you kidding? I, he said, where are you going to sell them? Well, they have record store day. I'm not sure if you're familiar. Sure, yeah, I oh, was, yeah. yeah. I wasn't. It turned out 1,500 sold immediately. And they're in their second pressing. That's and awesome. I'm laughing. I'm laughing because it's not about the money. You don't make a lot of money on it. But the idea, if you just said it, going full circle, and you know what? I found out I didn't even keep a phonograph player. So my son, Colin, bought me a phonograph records, I mean player, for Father's Day, nice. which was wonderful. So now I have the vinyl, one vinyl. I, get, I don't know what happened to the rest of them. So that's funny you mentioned vinyl. So when Jason put it out, he, I said, so what are you going to call it? It's got all these guest players over a period of years that I recorded. Eric Clapton's on it. Dickie yeah. Betts is on it. Leslie West is. I got these players. So if you look up Pompeii, that's what they gave the name of the record. Ian and I, Ian Hunter and I were joking about it way back in the 70s because that's when the punk rock vibe was coming in. So we were the oldsters. We were the dinosaurs. So when we were recording some of this music at Levon's and Woodstock, they called us, look up on the mountain, that's Pompeii. So we used the name. So the name of the record is Pompeii, but it's apparently people just loved it. Talk because it was, it was all, you know, it's all by tubes. It was old tape, two-inch tapes. It's the old style recording. That's but cool. Bob Clearmountain, who now is a rock and roll star in the studio, he was that was his first gig was to record us at the record plant. Or was it the record power station? Okay. I'm trying to remember. I'm having these brain farts. So I'm trying to remember all this stuff. Point being is that came out on vinyl and it's still available. But now when it's in a second pressing. Dig it, Scott. Now it's yellow vinyl, right? Because right they're all that they're limited editions. I don't even have a copy. I gotta go out and, on Amazon and get it, but I will. Uh, point being, what goes round is coming around, literally round and round. That's know? awesome. That's it so is. Cool. It was great, and uh, it is great. And uh, while I'm doing a promo uh, slut thing here, we have just finished. We as a couple of musicians from. Good friends, brilliant musicians, Chris Shutters and Mark Michael out of Toledo. We put together a record that's coming out, coming out Valentine's Day oh, cool. on, uh, I think it's Rouge or out of Detroit. And um, so that's what I'm, this is new. Now, between you and is, I. Is this, is this new mountain music? Is this mountain or is this something, another project? This is my album with these guys, but I gotta be—I okay. gotta be humble. It's these these guys; they're great players. We didn't know what to call it because it's not mountain music, but it has all the identification, all the feeling of what I hope would be the way mountain felt back in 1969, yeah. 1970. Yeah. But I'll let the audience be the judge of that. That's coming out in uh, in February. Awesome. So that's that, that's going to be great. I don't expect I don't expect anything. By the way, Scott, you know I just let it come out. People feel the way they feel. But I had the greatest time. I sound like Pollyanna here. The way I'm, I'm so happy. If I am, that, I'm no, tired, that's, but that's I'm, great. I'm, <laughs> no, that's so I'm great. Tired. I love I'm your happy. enthusiasm. That is like yeah. that's cool. It's well, just it's I, totally it cool. But let me tell you. So then this company out of uh, England, out of, um, they're called Gonzo, or Voice Print. Okay. They gathered a lot of, they asked my permission, they gathered a lot of retrospective, you know, paraffin memorabilia from me, and they put it in a box. And they're be, it's being released. It's a box. <laughs> I guess, you know, um, uh, uh, what's the drummer's name? Bill from, uh, come on, Court. Anyways, they put out a couple of boxes, and apparently people today, don't necessarily want to buy a DVD and or a CD, or they want a, they want a a compilation in a box, photographs, all the stuff that they can't get commercially in the box. That's cool. So the box is coming out, I believe, in the spring. 
So we'll see what that does. But here they wanted, they'd rather spend a hundred dollars on a comprehensive package of an artist that they like. And I'm going, that's great. That's great. I remember Radiohead did that. They, they put together and I don't know how many, how many fans there are. And you don't know, you'll never know. Some, you get new ones, you got the old one. The point is whatever it is, apparently that's, what they want these days, the young ones, old ones, because they save them. You know, you get the box. Okay, this is Bill Buford. I'm thinking of Bill Buford. Okay, a great shot. You know, they put a bo- they put a box out on him, and they pre- I guess they put together they produced uh, 200 boxes. It turns out they had a pre order of 5,000. Wow. At at a hundred odd pounds a box, and then Rick Wakeman they did because they have these artists they're friends with. The uh, the owner of that label is a, a sweetheart, and he just you know he says, "Do you have anything? Uh, do you have a telephone bill from 1964?" And I'm going, "You want a bet?" No. <laughs> Point being is that there's a whole different demand for different musicians. You know, the uh, I guess the loyalty of some of these fans are, are brilliant. It's brilliant that they would do that, and of course, as a musician. I, I hope they're not thinking that, well, let's get it before he buys the farm. You know what I mean? That they could have a little bit of that. But um, so a lot's going on, Scott. I'm rambling on here. Yeah, no, and, that's and, totally cool. And the Tell other thing yours. is my, my manager, who happens to be a professor in Helsinki, um, she co-wrote, well, she actually did, uh, she wrote a book that's coming out. We've been working on it for four years oh, wow. called Letters to Sarah. Sarah is my mother. And when I was in my local band traveling around Quebec and Ontario and Canada, I would write her all the time. I didn't know she saved all these letters over 20 years. And she put them in a box. I didn't know anything about it. But Tuya, my manager, happened to find this box at our rehearsal studio. And she said, wait a second. This is like a memoir because I would write her if I was in armpit Quebec. You know, I would write, dear mom, I'm doing this. And she has 180 letters over those years. In wow. any case, Tuya, my manager, who was a writer herself, put it together, letters to Sarah, which basically, Scott, comes out as time-wise in, in a window of time for 30 years. It becomes a memoir because it's all, so the letters are the catalyst. Yeah. And I didn't think anything of it. She was the writer. Tuja Takala, and she did a great job. So that book is coming out on Mother's Day oh, this sure. year. Ooh. You know, I don't know what it all means. Scott, I got to tell you, I don't know what it all means, you know. But at this stage, it's like Robert De Niro said, I just want to play. I just want to work. I just, you know what I mean? Right get on. it in. As long, as long as the subject matter is cool and it works, get it out there. Share it. Time to share. Well, you're capitalizing on the holidays. Right so go ahead. You, no, you, you are capitalizing on the holidays. That's for sure. You got some good stuff, you know, like coming out on Thank Valentine's you. Day and Mother's Day. And we've yeah. got New Year's Eve coming up. And I do want to touch on this because you're going to be with your friend, Warren Haynes, the Beacon Theater in New York City. Yeah. Yeah. And, and I know that yeah, this that's... has been something that's been going for a while now. I mean, you've been playing with him for, for a number Over of years. Over years. Yeah. yeah. Well, if I can just put it in capsule form, watch me do this. Um, Warren Haynes has always been a Mount fan. He used to come to the shows. And, of course, in those days, he was just starting to play with the Allman Brothers. Right. But but Warren wanted to make his own band. And as he tells me this, he said, Cork, the reason why there's Government Mule is I wanted a band like Mount, which cool. was amazing. So way back, even the late 90s, he would come to Toronto with Government Mule, and he I'd look him up. I didn't really know him that well, but I started you know, sitting in, and we became close friends. Here's the thing. Let me just tell you a quick story. When 2011 came around, he was playing the Beacon Theater. He was just starting his traditional show at the Beacon Theater New Year's Eve. I went there. Matt Aft's the drummer, sit talking. He says, Cork, I got to tell you, I heard New Year's Eve that the, the Government Mule fan base is requesting that, they, that Government Mule do a cover. And they asked the fan base what song 
that they wanted Warren to cover. It turns out, coincidentally, it was Nantucket sleigh ride. And Matt is telling me that day, the day before New Year's, by the way, I think we're going to play Nantucket Sleigh Ride New Year's Eve. And I said, I said, well, that's great. You know, and then he looked at me and he says, the only thing is, Cork, there's a 5-4 a section when the sleigh ride comes in really fast and you're playing, you know, really. He says, is that 5-4 or 7-8? I'm looking at it. I'm like, I have no idea what you're talking about, Matt. But then he says, well, wait a second. You're here. If you're around tomorrow. Why aren't you playing, sitting in and playing Nantucket Sleigh Ride with us? I said, I haven't been invited, Matt. Anyway, she says, no, no. We go upstairs that night and we sit and, you know, Warren's taking a break. He's sitting there. I walk in and he says, he says, Cork, I know what you're going to say. I know. Why aren't you being invited to play that? Let me tell you, Cork, over the last 10, 15 years, I've come to see you and Leslie West play mountains. He says, you guys are jamming so much. You Johnny, that I don't recognize the song. And he says, Corky, I don't think you even remember how to play that type of sleigh ride. That's why I haven't invited you. So I look at him and he says, he says, Cork, I'll tell you what, sound check tomorrow, New Year's Eve day, come in. If you learn the song properly and we rehearse it, if it comes out cool, you're in. Okay, so sure enough, I go home, Scott, and I'm listening to that type of sleigh ride. I have no idea what that drummer's doing. I, I actually, he's right. I forgot most of the parts. So I practiced on my own, went back the next day, walk in, and we play Nantucket. And Warren looks at me with a big smile, says, Cork, you're on for tonight. Nice. Okay, which was good. So that caused me to think about how many times people have called me musicians and say, why aren't you playing Mountain This Mountain? And I realized because... Like Warren says, unless you're going to play the songs the way your audience remembers the songs, you're going to lose them. And he, and, he, and Warren was very straight. He said, you guys lost me there. I don't know what you did to those songs. So right now, there is a CD. Here we go. Oh, boy, Cork, you are such a slut. Okay, there is a, C, there is a CD, Scott, that is coming out. It's actually available online okay. on Rouge Records. And it's Corky Lang place mountain and it's a dvd we recorded and audio and video and it's yeah you can order it i think and okay. i here's the funny thing is i don't know where this shit is available i shouldn't say that amazon the, amazon where, everything's available amazon, on amazon that's you know? right amazon yeah. just go to amazon and i sorry i did not mean to say shit it's repertoire and it's because i'm a little tired i'm letting it go but we've had worse things fly on rock titan tv here quirky it's okay <laughs> I tell you, I'm having a good time, and it's a good thing I had that coffee because I'm ready to roll now. Carry on, Scott. Hit me. Yeah, yeah, yeah. No, I tell you what, I don't know what uh, levels of caffeine are like safe or not, but yeah. I, I don't know that I could ingest your level of caffeine. I don't know. Well, it, yeah, I I have to say it's my big addiction is caffeine. Well, you know what? Point, it, it, it used to cost me seventy dollars for a cup of caffeine. Yeah, yeah. Get it. Go ahead. Well, it's, it, of all the addictions one could have. That would yeah. be a, the, one of the more safe ones, I would imagine, all, you know? It is. It's, it's also legal, which is kind of cool. Yeah, right? Until it isn't, yeah. you know? Who knows? Who yeah. knows these Who days, knows? you Go know? Ahead. But, uh, yeah. So, with all the different projects you have going on, I know that uh, some years back, you got started yeah. with this playing God the Rock opera. How's that been doing now for the last few years? That's been great. Uh, that started... Way back when I was playing on the boat in Stockholm, they have a book boat called Rocket Sea. Okay. Way back. And it turns out that my brother's a professor. So in between millions, I have to make a few bucks. He would hire me to do guest <laughs> lecturing. And I would use the the record business as the uh, as the uh, the grid. And I'd go in and talk. To, he was in the marketing at the University of Montreal and McGill. So he would invite me in to do guest lecturing, which I loved. Anyways, fast forward, I got hired by the University of Western Ontario, which is like the Yale of Canada. Oh, wow. And they, they asked me to, to make a course because they had the faculty of, mu of musicians, so music, which was huge, and they had the business administration faculty. Okay. So they wanted me to go in there at the time, 40 years, of surviving and living quite nicely. Um, in the music industry. So I put together a course called Advanced Studies 
in the music industries, talking about publishing, copyright, all that, and put it together. It worked out very well. I happen to love teaching that course. And by the way, Scott, they call me Professor Lang. I mean, how much better does it get? Come on. Is that, I God, I, I, yeah, I was kissing myself. Yeah, the, point, the, the point is, is I was on the boat. So at the, every year I'd play this boat with Le, with Leslie, and then I played with this band, uh, the Memory Thieves. And in other words, I would go regular. And these professors, Maddie and Tuya, professors at the University of Helsinki, they loved. Well, they were heavy metal. A lot of the a lot of the schools take the heavy metal seriously, especially the um, you know the universities. Anyways, long story short. They said, listen, we're, we have a book called Playing God, and we're making it into an opera. Would you write the music? Because the opera was really very involved. It was very sophisticated. You know, clones, uh, extended life. There were all these stories within the opera about, um, about uh, ma manipulation of the cells, you know, all that stuff. And after morally there are a few things that walk the line like you know can you actually make a human being these are pretty advanced academic stories right and they asked they asked me because my music was so simple can you write the music for the story which i did and i loved it as it turned out we we played in switzerland we did the show the musicians are really the actors you know we have a, these really great uh, scandinavian um uh, players that came in. We have a couple of Brits that came in. These are mostly university uh, professors or students. And they put together this self-contained show, which was called Playing God. I was asked to write some of the songs, most of them actually. And it was a great, you know, somebody tells you what, you know, tells you the, I guess, the content of, of the, of the prose. It's wonderful because you just write the music. You don't have, to, you know, you take on the identity of the characters. Anyways, it went very well. We played University of Helsinki. We played University of Manchester. You had to set it up in the philosophy department in those days. Okay. So basically, and then we came to New York and we played the K Theater. We played there under the auspices of the university, you know, uh, academic uh agenda and it's still going on but we've also recorded a video and dvd of playing god which now is being looked at being distributed to the universities because the actual show is almost are you following me don't fall asleep on me scott <laughs> do i look like i'm following a sleep professor no no i'm looking i'm leading it no what i'm saying is that it goes on but yes playing god so they're using it as some sort of, they wanted to put sex and rock and roll into philosophy. That's what I did. I didn't right. do it personally, but that's what it's about. They wanted to give uh, the philosophy um, stories some sort of groove, you know? So that was the idea of the rock opera. And uh, it's, yeah, it, it will be available on, uh, I think it could be right now, on Amazon also. All right. Well, and, I'll make sure. And the name of the band that plays that plays the music is called The Perfect Child All because right. actually ultimately that story is about creating the perfect human race. That's and we know scary. how topical that can be. That is you very know, scary. Stems all stem cell research, manipulation of the cell. It's pretty it's pretty involved. Way over my head, by the way, but I loved writing the music, and of course, writing with with Tuya and Maddie was wonderful. It's it's really a whole different thing, but it's music, that's, right, Scott? That it sounds like an amazing project, and uh, we will definitely get that information to share with your fan base out there. So we'll be adding in the lower thirds and whatnot. But that'd that, be great. That'd and, be great. And yes. since you love teaching, and you know, now that I know you, Professor Lang, that's how I shall address you from <laughs> now on. It's no longer just Corky, Professor, thing, but... yes, Professor Lang. So, you know, for everyone that's watching this and listening to our conversation right now, you know, right. there's probably a lot of things that, you know, maybe you and I didn't have a chance to talk about, you know, that we won't have a chance to talk about today, but that, you know, in the 
year ahead in 2019, we definitely have to sync back up and catch up and uh, kind of get a pulse on where things stand. But for people that want to come out and maybe talk to you on their own directly, uh, from what I understand, there is this uh, new apparatus out there, this application known as Meat Hook that you've gotten involved with. And, uh, oh, you... the Meat Hook. Yeah, thank you for bringing that up. Absolutely. Yeah, yeah I wanted to that's... touch on that. Go ahead, go ahead. Yeah. No, I was just, I wanted to touch on that because I had a chance to talk to Carmine a piece about it a little bit because I know that he's dabbled with it. And I just think it's such a cool way for kind of that virtual VIP meet and greet experience to exist yeah. in which someone can come out and say, you know what, Scotty J, you know, he, he, he missed the mark, you know, with, with Professor Lang, you know, there's some things that <laughs> I wanted to talk about, you know. So you now, like cartoons. So <laughs> now they have a way to do that. Now they have a way to go out and they can talk to you one-on-one -on -one if they want to. Have you been using this much lately? Yes, I have been using it. I've been remiss in going. I started about a year or two ago, okay. but I was on the road overseas. I just forgot about it. It's my fault. But yeah, Anthony put together this, uh, this idea. It's a very wonderful high-tech way of connecting on different levels, like you said, right. with, with the artist, with the musician in this case. And yes, I do. And yeah, I think it's pretty reasonable. If somebody wants to talk to me about specifically, and it's happened, like, okay, what happened with 10 years after? How come you played on, on going home and this and that, whatever? And I remember I said, really? You want me to tell it? He says, he says yeah, I don't mind spending the money for your time. I said, no, no, this is a, I'll comp this one, you know. It's not about money. It's really about giving back. Because the people that look up Meat Hope, they get in there, it's not just, okay, you do one, two, three, four, one, two, three, four, one. You know, it's not a paradiddle. You yeah. get in and these are life chats. They're life chats. They want to know, so what happened here? Why did this go down? I mean, some of the questions are really out there, yeah. especially since you have Wikipedia. And, and people are telling me stuff in my life, as well as you, Scott. Like, by the way, do you remember you did this? And you're going... Did I do that? You know, <laughs> you, know? <laughs> you know what I'm saying? That's what happens. There's a lot of information and you got to deal with it. And uh, yeah, yeah, it's uh, the meat hook. If somebody wants to talk to me or go over certain patterns or whatever, you just do it on the phone. That's cool. So, and, and I've used it myself. I've gotten in touch with, with Carmine. He doesn't know it's me. You know, <laughs> <laughs> I wouldn't let him have that, have that opportunity but the point is is that who do you learn from you right. learn from your 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 peers you know you learn from people that that you respect and stuff and yeah there are still people out there and you're right especially the young musicians they want to get you know they want they don't want the shortcut but they do want the fork in the road they want to know well, why did you do this and not this right because they, they're going to see that the fork in the road is really important in in this world of ours, would you want to go back and be a teenager right now, Scott? Yes. You would? Okay, yes. It took me a long time to think about that, didn't it? Yeah. No. <laughs> you know what? With a provision. With a provision okay. that I would have to take the knowledge that I have now with me. Yeah. Oh, I don't know about now, that. Now, that's cheating, dee, right? Dee, that's dee, cheating. Dee, 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 dee. I'm right. not sure you could do yeah, that. No. You know what? I wouldn't trade it. I wouldn't trade it. I trade the way that I feel when I wake up in the morning, when my feet hit the yeah. floor after getting out of bed, you know. Yeah. But no, other than that, I wouldn't trade it for all, all the money in the world because, you know, if I were a teenager, I wouldn't know anything about anything, you know. Right. And then I wouldn't have the means to have a most excellent conversation with you right now, you know. Well, thank so. you. Yeah, I, I agree. I mean, we're chatting. There's a lot, you know, it's like... That's the wonderful thing about the, I guess, the music and the film. Enter I hate the word entertainment, but it comes into it. It's just a lot of fun. Yeah. You yeah, know, yeah. and when you're playing in a band, you want to make sure you have a great, because you're jumping in the bed with these guys. This is much more intimate than a lot of relationships. So it's kind of like there are certain things, one of the priorities, you want to have fun. You don't want to deal with assholes. You don't want to deal with somebody's family. Right. You want to play. And you want to you want to really um, have fun, yeah. have a great time. And I got to tell you, again, really lucky playing with the guys that I played with. Most of the musicians that I fell in love with over the years, 
they're real human beings. They're nice. they're not you know they're not pretentious. Nice. Now, now are we going to be are we going to be touring at all with your uh, mountain band in 2019? Yeah, yes. Yeah. As a matter of fact, we will start our tour in May. Okay. We're waiting. Yeah, we're going to put together a proper cohesive. Uh, promotion a marketing strategy i don't know exactly what that means scott i gotta be honest <laughs> these do they know these days that hey what we're doing now is marketing this sure. is me we're working but it's good marketing yeah. because it's honest yeah. and the, the point is is that um the touring starting in may we're going uh, back to europe and the uk in S september okay and uh in the summer they're lining up this 50 years anniversary for Woodstock. Do you believe that? 50 years. I'm getting calls on that one. And I say, why are they calling me? Are you that missing your your audio now? Scott, are you uh, there? Yeah, no, are I'm here. Can you hear okay. me? Yeah, yeah. No, I'm, just, I, I'm thinking to myself, who's still alive, God? You know, because they're looking for the musicians. And thank God, yes, I... But we'll see what happens. Think about that, 50 years. You're part of an elite class. <laughs> You're a part it's of an elite like, class. The, the criteria is I have a pulse. Yeah. That's the criteria. And right. the point, no, it would be fun if they did it. But what they're doing is they're putting Woodstock tours together. They're getting some of the people, the musicians, artists that played at Woodstock or were part of that world, and they're putting them on the road. And, of course, to gather people from that era. In those days, it was hard enough to gather them. Can you imagine? Yeah, I tell you what, you know what would be fascinating, Professor? Uh, <laughs> okay. I, I can't get over that. I'm sorry. I can't help myself now. No, yeah. but Dorothy, seriously, uh, to somehow get together all of the bands, all of the musicians that were at the original Woodstock, as well yeah. as all of the people that attended the original Woodstock. And if you were to put that together now, I wonder what that would look like. You know, like, well, that, yeah, that's, that's, that's interesting. You the know, first thing, the first thing that comes to mind is old. <laughs> you know what I mean? I mean, think about it. the people that went to Woodstock. They had to be at least eighteen to twenty-five, at least, right? So I'm thinking, wow, it's fifty years later. You mm -hmm. know, so you can mm -hmm. add on. You know, add on that. I gotta just let me get rid of this car. Here we come on. Okay. Yeah, right. there, there you are. Yeah, oh, wait, you froze up on me. Be, okay, there we go. Be, okay. It would be wonderful. I think that's what they're trying to do. I don't know about the people, but I would imagine there's a lot of you know grandchildren right now yeah. that um, that would love to get just to be near the vibe. You can never create that vibe again. I was ever. just going to ask you: Would it ever be possible to recapture that kind of magic? I mean, could that even no. be done? No, I got a feeling what they're doing now with Coachella, you know, La Palusa, the festivals now are bigger than the actual artists. In other words, you don't even have to worry who you're booking. You right. call it a festival, and the, which to me, that's what was happening. After Woodstock, Mountain used to have a Learjet because we would be playing three and four festivals a day around America. Wow. Think about it. We, well, we did uh, the one up in Canada, and then Strawberry Fields, and then we zipped down to Atlanta and played that, and then we go to Texas, but you couldn't get a regular airline, so F Felix decided we get this Learjet. And, uh, that you know, we never stuck around long enough to get a vibe. You know what I mean? We're like, we're boom, bam, boom, and we're on our way. Same with Hendrix. When I was playing with Noel, we had, you know, Noel, myself, and Eric Shankman from the Spin Doctors well, in the late 90s, before, God bless him, Noel passed away. We would talk, Noel would talk about the Hendrix thing, which was very similar at the time as that era. It really, they, there was no music business. It was just road touring, you know. It was right. very... It was new. It was nobody knew what the, there was no, there was no book to study. There was on no that. Live Nation. <laughs> that, that, that's right. The yeah. point is, it moves along, yeah. you know. And all those guys at Live Nation, you know, in those days, they were like personal friends, you know. Whether it was Ron Delson in New York, he'd hang around with the musicians. He still does in his own way, but everything changes, and um, even the changes are changing. You know right. what I mean? That's what happens. And what are you going to do? You got to really enjoy it. I mean, you, you know, you come full circle. What's Scott doing there? Let me check in with him. I got some news for him. Right you on. know, that kind of. It's all right because you got this little box here that we're talking to. 
which is, by the way, it's pretty fucking amazing. We got to go check that out. We got to go check that this. out for sure. And I'll have to get all that information. So again, we can share that, you know, with the audience so they can have a chance to go buy it. But, uh, Corky, thank you so much. It's been such hey. an honor and such a privilege speaking with you. Again, everybody, we are here with the legendary drummer, Corky Lang. And, uh, oh, man, you know, make sure you have a chance to uh, go check out the new music that he's putting out of Corky Lang's yeah. Mountain. If I think what happens, I would be told by my manager to tell whoever it is who's interested, go to CorkyLangWorks.com. Okay. And everything, I think, is there. And uh, God bless you, uh, Scott. Thank you very much. You're, I'm humbled that it's very kind. And I'll just keep on playing and trying to impress you. Yes. How's that? Yeah. Okay? I want, we need pictures of the new drum kit. I want to see the new drum kit. You're going to get that. You're going to, going to get it. You'll probably be everywhere because I'm going to photo jam it everywhere. Very you cool. Know? It's very, very cool, Scott. And yeah. thank you for support. And thank have you. A, you know, God bless you on the holidays. Thank you. All yes. Happy best. New Year. Happy New Year. Mississippi Queen.